Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or a professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. What is neuro-linguistics? I have the foggiest idea. But with me is a practitioner who is going to explain what it is. And I would like to welcome Maxine Zikowski. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Is neuro-linguistic. Neuro-linguistic programming, better known as NLP by most people, is uh, a model for thinking about thinking. It's a communication model. And it's got applications that are quite myriad. Initially, it was used a lot for psychotherapy, which is one of the most popular. It's used by motivational speakers, life coaches. It's a change methodology that was originally designed for betterment. Only more often than not, people come in only when the wing's a little busted and they need some help. How can we start changing things slowly so that we can adjust ourselves mm -hmm. in our everyday life? Well, first of all, people need to be mindful of the ways in which they're communicating to themselves. For example? For example, you have this business of stating things in the positive. Now, linguistically, in your neurology, if I were to offer you a cup and say, don't spill this, in order for you to process that in this biocomputer, you have to imagine a spilled cup. Don't spill this. You test out 30 ways of spilling it, including the wet trickling on your skirt. Instead, you haven't devoted yourself. Or I haven't told you where to go. Be careful with this cup. And you'll generate 30 ways of being careful with it and being aware. You do this with a child. Don't fall. It's slippery out. They're practicing having their little tushies hit the pavement. <laughs> It's not just new age stuff. So when you say something negative to somebody else. Or yourself. Or yourself. More important. You are basically reinforcing everything. And so that happens versus if you change and say the positive so that you give yourself positive feedback. The important thing to remember from the point of view of this being a biocomputer. Okay. The unconscious doesn't know the difference between what you imagine and what's real so that if you are imagining falling or spilling the glass or oh my god I'm going to miss the bus this morning you will you will fall you and you will spill you are experiencing it a hundred times oh I don't want to be embarrassed because I'm on a talk show or I don't want to be upset with my boss this morning or my new client you are rehearsing being upset and running all those scenarios and they're literally a chemical and electrical event in your body that's going to shut you down again and again. So what we have to do is be positive in what we're saying, even to ourselves or how we handle something. Absolutely. The most important thing to do is to initially stop and notice what you're doing and shift your gears. Pull back from that and go, OK, what do I want instead? I want to. Consider all the possible ways I'm going to have a great meeting with my boss, how I'm going to meet that new client and do a great job, how I'm going to be kind to my child and saying, I don't want to be a meanie, I don't want to be like my mother, I don't want to be mean. When you do that, all you're doing is accessing every unpleasantness. If you do the opposite and stop yourself, that's what all the eidetic imagery that's being used around is. You rehearse things, guided visualizations, or hypnosis. Well, let's ha all right. Let's start with self-esteem. What can we program ourselves to say? That's to build? an interesting, interesting point. And in NLP, we talk a great deal about the effect of language, not just verbal, but also visual mm -hmm. and kinesthetic, okay. on your nervous system. And when you nominalize something, that's just a technical word for taking a process and turning it into a noun so that a self-esteem becomes an object that's not alive anymore, that can be damaged, that can be undermined, that can be stolen, that can be destroyed by your family, by your acquaintances, by the divorce. 
if instead you take it back to the verb, esteeming. Esteeming of self you're in charge of. You can be esteeming yourself a little less because you've been lazy and slept away half your Saturday. Or you can be esteeming yourself very high because hot darn, you've got so much done today and you're really proud of yourself. We choose that. People talk about health and chasing health. Oh, I need vitamins, I need this, I need to chase health. If you step back to healing, you're in charge of that process and it's a 24 hour process. Let's go back to health. How okay. can we improve our health? I mean, give us, give us feedback instead of saying, I'm gonna chase the vitamins. Mm -hmm. What can we say about okay. maintaining good health? To stop talking about health and start engaging a healing process. When you shift back to a verb, it's an important thing. It puts you at cause instead of effect. Okay. Your health is at effect. It's again a nominalization. Show me a health. How big is it? Can you put it in a wheelbarrow? <laughs> the healing process is something that you engage and you're doing it all the time. And if you are healing yourself emotionally, physically, mentally, you start to go, okay, what do I need to feel better? I know, I need to take a minute break. I need a little vacation in my head. I'll remember the time I was at the beach instead of slugging through all of the slush in the street today and remember something beautiful. Or the reason why you're putting up with this commute, whatever it is that's unpleasant, and simply remember that you're doing it so that your child can go to the college that she or he wants. And all of a sudden you go, yes! You put yourself where the outcome is, what you really, really want. So let's say you have an illness, mm -hmm. and you just say you want to get 100% cured from mm -hmm. whatever you got, whether it's mm -hmm. cold, it's cancer, um, Whatever. Mm -hmm. You just keep saying to yourself, I am it's dancing. More, uh, that's part of it, and it's bigger than that. It's what you see, hear, feel, smell, taste. So that if you're busy going, oh, I, I want to be well, but I'm shaking in my boots, and the statistics are this, you've got lots of levels of it going on. There's the foreground of you saying, I want to be terrific, and there's the background of, ah, going on and my mom died of breast cancer and when's my time up? If instead you build a time, you can place this out as a metaphor. We live our metaphors physically in our bodies. Lay a timeline on the floor. The one that says, okay, the doctor said, these are my statistics. Leave it there. Put all of your feelings for that out on that timeline. Then build another one to where you wanna go. To you being vibrantly healthy and to counseling someone else because you know what it's like to be a survivor for 10 years, for 20 years. And you can see that out there and you walk that. And all of the things that you imagine may or may not have happened to get you there. And you make that real. We create our own realities moment to moment. And we do them by our own senses internally. Same way that we take in the world with our senses externally. So. If I want to become a millionaire, all I got to do is visualize the fact that I am living in this palatial apartment here in Manhattan, or is it a little bit more than that? It's probably a little more than that because you can have that visualization, and if you have beliefs that who am I to be better than my dad, I can't tell you how many life coachings I've done with yuppies who were shooting themselves in the foot or driving with one foot on the gas and one foot on the brakes because back when they were 10, they promised that my dad's the best guy in the world, I'm gonna grow up to be just like him, and there's a whole cluster of beliefs that say, who am I to be better than dad? And they stop, and they put a ceiling there. So in order to break through the ceiling, you need to identify the cluster of beliefs that support the idea of you being just low man on the totem pole, or doing a great job and somebody else getting the credit for it or the financial benefit for it. So how do you do this? 
Ideally, you go see someone else. You can cut your own hair, but if you've got a mirror to give you some feedback, which is essentially the job of an NLP trainer or practitioner, someone who's well-trained acts as that mirror to give you feedback on what you're doing. As we put up smoke streams, all kinds of red herrings, we will defend the way we're organizing our beliefs for all we're worth. And the ones that we're conscious of are usually what, oh, I did that bad, oh, I did that bad. So to and start changing, you would say, oh, I was great at this. I am terrific. It's so important to look at the full part of the cup. I once had a client who literally lived in the empty part of his cup at the top of the glass, which was a fraction of an inch. And this is a guy who was the son of a gazillionaire who, I don't exist, it's only because of my dad. And he was in there, always. Then I had a wonderful client. So what was, happened? Wait, wait, what would you uh, do? It's a long story with him. But the contrast is, I had a client who was a little old man from Russia, right. who had just lost his wife to cancer that had metastasized. She had been a, a pro bono patient of mine for about a year and a half. And he would only focus on the few drops in the bottom. This is an 80-year-old man who's living on partial welfare. They took his apartment away because there aren't two of you anymore. And they shipped him up to Albany. Oh, my. No community support, no son and, and grandchildren living nearby. And he'll call me and say, oh, I'm so happy. I'm so blessed. I miss my Rosa. I miss the children. I miss the ocean. But I'm so blessed. There are woods here. I walk five miles every day. I get healthier and healthier. And I speak better English. They teach me. And the best, I get to take care of little babies. They have a school here for girls who have unwed children, and oh, going on and on and on. Everyone would have said, he has no hope. He's living in the middle of no. He looks at the full part of the cup, even though there's 10 drops, and is splashing and celebrating life. Now, Matt, we are in a culture that has taught us to ah, pretty much look at what's wrong with this picture, <laughs> <laughs> instead of bettering. OK, look at what you do well and do it better and better and better. So it's, it's technically a mindset of how you believe. Always, always, always it's perspective, you bet. OK. And when you shift perspective, and that's the whole point of NLP. So basically, it's what you start talking to yourself about, you and, know, like I and am. And how you image things. OK. If you talk to yourself about, I will be healthy, or I will be rich, and you're picturing an empty bank account <laughs> in your mind, or a pile of bills this high, and how soon can I get out of my credit card debt? You're, you're giving yourself mixed messages, and that's driving with one foot on the gas and one on the brake. Now, before we started taping, you were talking about how you helped some real estate agents proceed with cold calling because they got stuck. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about... We all get stuck in a lot of different ways. And there's a very simple behavior change, because that's what popularized NLP, behavior change. Mm -hmm. Even though there's much deeper and richer work, which is belief change, even identity change. And that's complicated and takes a lot of time. But the behavior changes are that fast sometimes. Um, this young woman was excellent at what she did, but she cared about her client so much that she'd look at the phone and hear all the complaints, all of the distrust about this particular one and that one, and they accreted so that she'd look at the phone and go, um, I need a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to powder my nose, anything but to pick up that phone. So how did you work it so that you would start picking up the phone again? That's, that's the fun part in NLP because you can tailor it for a given job, you can tailor it for a given person. I had her picture her phone and to disassociate from it. We made it flat and two-dimensional. Okay. This is playing with the submodalities, the modalities being your primary senses. Put a frame around it so that she's got a picture here of the very phone she uses. And put all of those feelings of anxiety, guilt, confusion right onto it. Hold it, feel it all there, and then turn it over to the blank side. Then I had her put all the resources there. Okay, remember a time when 
you felt excited about what you're about to accomplish, a time when you knew you were doing such a good job that you couldn't wait to reward yourself with something that you were going to give yourself for doing a terrific job, whether that's a weekend away or time with your kids, something fantastic. Put it there, make it a movie, make it 3D. Step into it, live it. Now, freeze frame that, lay it there. And then pick out something that you always have time for, like your favorite activity, whether that's running in the park, playing with your dog, feeding your family, something that you always have time for and that gives you deep joy. Step into that movie as though it's happening to you now. Have all of that go on in your nervous system. See it there, be there with it. Then step out of it, leave it there. So you've got a transparency and another transparency. And then pick out your very favorite food, one that's guilt-free. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Smell it, taste it, take a big bite and enjoy. And place that on the top so that you're seeing through that favorite food, that unbelievably favorite activity, to that sense of accomplishment in challenge. Lock them into the back there. Then turn it over and look at that phone. So you've got a big frame here with that phone. Now take your hand and push it right through there and pull through that transparency of achieving and feeling wonderful and wanting to reward yourself for doing a darn good job. Then pull through that favorite activity that you always have time for because you love doing it and it fulfills you. And then pull through your favorite food so that you're seeing that phone through that luscious food, that favorite activity with loved ones, and that sense of accomplishment. Lock them in there and experience that phone that way from now on. She couldn't believe how completely three months of not being able to look at a phone disappeared and she couldn't wait to get on one. Wow. That could be applied to almost anything. Bingo. One of the other things that we had been talking about yeah. is I said the word, well, I try. Yeah. And you got on my case something fierce. I'm sorry. That's okay. I mean, I learned from it, so now I try not to say, <laughs> try. I try. What can I say? In the same way that you stop saying not all the time, because you literally will get knots in your shoulder or in your guts, shifting into saying things in the positive, Try is something ubiquitous in our culture. We're taught to try. You're a good person if you try real hard. If you do things naturally because you're talented and it's effortless, we don't forgive people who get straight A's without studying. Not any time that I've noticed. <laughs> so we pay for it with sweat and with sturm und drang. And every word you use is literally run through your nervous system in a split second. You know that from the way Google will process millions of pages on millions of sites in a split second. The biocomputer that you are does the same thing. So try is attempt, which is the Yoda thing of try versus do. There is no do. There's, there's no try. There's only do. And it gets more complicated. It's test. And most people are phobic of being tested because it goes in both directions. Right. It's also struggle. And the minute that you get on the phone with someone and they ask you, can you get me that information by tomorrow night? You're cataloging and listing everything that can and should go wrong, everything you're going to struggle with, every obstacle. Because we want to try real hard. You're a good person if you try. It doesn't matter if you get it done so long as you struggle real hard. If you're attempting to get out of the house, you're trying to get out of the house. Right. You look at your watch, oh, I'm running late. Try to get out of here. I've got a train to catch to go upstate. OK. You will spend five minutes on the phone explaining to someone why you have no time to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> you will lose the keys and do this wonderful self-hypnosis of never being able to find them for five minutes because you're focused not on getting out the door, but on struggling with obstacles. And you'll dance with all of them. If instead you shift out of that language pattern and into do your best to get out the door, then the verb is still get out the door and your focus is on, I'm on that train. 
I made it. The phone rings, you let the answering machine do That's what they're for. You lose the keys. You're going to just remember that you know where the spare set lives. And you just float over obstacles because you're in a solution mode. And you get, get out the door effortlessly. Do men and women think differently? Or is it basically the same techniques that you're talking about can be applied to a man or a child? Yes and no. <laughs> oh, all right. No two people are alike. Okay. We make generalizations. I've had people who had phobias that should have been visual because most of our culture is visual, and theirs was entirely run in an auditory model. You know, we talk about visual and auditory and kinesthetic and gustatory and olfactory and NLP, your five senses, because that's how we sort out the world and make sense out of it. There's no real meaning in anything. We process stuff and decide that roller coasters are a nightmare or roller coasters are whoopee. They're a piece of metal. <laughs> There's no whoopee in anything. There's no nightmare. We invest meaning in the world. You shift from try and you make a habit of it. Shift into do your best. You're literally creating a mini transinduction. You're inviting your unconscious to bring out your resources, your best. And you automatically step over the obstacles because you're in solution mode. So in other words, get rid of the word try from one's vocabulary. Exactly. Okay. It puts you into so much stress. And stress shuts down your immune system and it makes you miserable. Uh, we were talking earlier. There are two kinds of stress. Distress, which is the one we're talking about right now, and you stress. And you stress, there's a very thin line between excitement and shutdown horror. And you stress is excitement. Because you're happy. Or. Oh, no, maybe. No. It, you can be happy. You can also be really interested and challenged. Okay. It's excitement. You can look at challenge and find that exciting instead of routine. And that's excitement. That's you stress. And that brings you into a positive mode where things will start to go smoothly exactly. and be fulfilling. You start bringing out your resources and you feel accomplished. If it's a routine day, most people have less sense of accomplishment. It's just, I got through the day. Is this something one should do every morning when they get up to make sure that they're balanced? It's a little odd. I mean, it's a little new agey stuff there, like you were talking about. There's a lot about. of new age stuff because the nervous system is the nervous system, the same way that we all know that acupuncture exists and there are energy meridians in the body. And this is just tapping along a couple of those meridians to center yourself so that if you're flying off this way and flying off that way because you're getting breakfast for everybody in the household and attempting to pull yourself together for the day, if you just tap on what's called the third eye chakra, mm -hmm. under the nose, which is the end of the meridian, under the lower lip, and then on the thymus. And remember to breathe while you're doing it. Oh, minor technicality. <laughs> yes, that helps. You just center your energy a little bit, or a lot, depending on how far gone you were to begin with. Do you need to do this more than once a day? Yes. We accumulate all kinds of nonsense. Crossing a street in Manhattan is taking your life in your hands. You get a great sense of accomplishment when you get to the other side successfully. At least I do. I find it very exciting. It's a challenge. How can somebody enrich their lives? Identifying whatever is stopping them from having it the way they want to. There's the business of laying out that plan, and then you begin to look at what is there in beliefs, what is there in the way they're communicating to themselves that keeps them smaller than they'd like to be? Or in old patterns that are so ingrained in their personality. And going to a professional, there are many people doing neurolinguistic programming, we call it NLP for short, that are good at what they do. Most life coaches are operating out of that. And this is all about enrichment so that you get to be a better parent, a better business person or employee, a healthier human being, because you're healing at every level all of the time. You're operating out of the idea that you have the best 
in front of you and that you're getting better every day. Resources, so that the full part of the cup is where you live and you learn to celebrate life more and more. That's the best way to live as far as I'm concerned. I do my best to get there and I know in the course of my life I have changed so much because of this. There was a time, believe it or not, when I couldn't publicly speak. My voice would crack, my knees would shut. How did you solve the problem? Bandler, Richard Bandler, who created NLP, chose me out of the audience. You up here. And that took the edge off of it because mine was complicated. It wasn't a single thing. There were so many parts of who I was woven into that fabric. And over a period of about a year and a half, that and other beliefs that started to show up that supported that idea of, I'm a bad person if I'm doing something well. That's what I actually believed and didn't know it. If I'm doing something better than someone else, shame on me, I made them feel bad. If I don't do my very best, I've been lazy and cheated, shame on me. <laughs> it was a double bind I had at a very high level of identity, who I am, not what I do. And that cleared up, so much so that I started doing, um, because opportunities will come to you when you're open. I started doing um, local talk shows on television, network things, you name it. And it's just easy because you shift from being focused on yourself when you're phobic of speaking to what can I give the audience? What can I give people? And if you're in that mode, you hear it all the time from performers. They're anxious before they go on, and as soon as they're on stage, what can I give that audience? That's beautiful. That's absolutely fabulous. Maxine, what would you like to leave the audience with? Please, give yourself yourself. That's the biggest gift you can give to yourself. Step back and know that being you as thoroughly and as honestly as you can because you're unique on the planet. And that allows you to give that to your friends, to your work, to your health, your fitness, everything. Be you. That's a special thing to celebrate. Maxine, I want to thank you so much for joining me. This has been so spectacular. It's been a great pleasure for me. Thank you. And I hope you learn to be you. We'd love to hear from you. Please write. You can ask Maxine any kind of questions. She'd love to respond, and I would just love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us.